Hi there, friends. Hi there, enemies. <laughs> Sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference. Cesare here, and I want to talk about Karl Marx today. I uh, am absolutely astonished how many people follow this hideous hobgoblin of a man without knowing a damn thing about his private life, oh, which is appalling. He, he was a horrendous man. How you expect a man who couldn't run his own family and his own household to have the answers to running the entire world beggars belief. Now I know when you go for Marx, leftists, and it doesn't matter whether they are Marxists or socialists or uh, Leninists or Trotskyites, you know, it's all the same thing, and there are dilutions and uh, concentrations. So uh, the, the full uh, concentration will be Marx, a person who follows Marx, a Marxist, a uh, Leninist. A Trotskyite will probably be a concentrated version of Marx, inflamed and more bloody and bloodthirsty, if that is possible. And then we have the dilution like socialism. And it doesn't matter where it starts, it all ends in the same place. It's basically like putting arsenic in a well of water to, uh, for a village. If you put a little drop in uh, every day, you slowly po uh, poison that entire village. And if you put a whole, dump a whole lot in, you poison them quickly. So socialism is the slow poison and Marxism is the fast poison and it really makes no difference. But uh, this is basically a cult. It is a religion. It is the worship of the state. This is statism. Marx is one of their holy prophets. And when you say anything against the church of statism, regardless of what dilution and concentration uh, they are indoctrinated into, they come for you. This is like uh, the Inquisition in the old Catholic Church. If you commit heresy or blasphemy against one of their prophets or one of their tenets, they become absolutely incensed. It's the Inquisition. They will destroy lives. They will make sure that people lose their jobs. They will. Uh, there is no end that they will not go to because they are absolutely um, devout in their belief. And you cannot use reason and logic with them. And the reason for that is indoctrination, basically. You have to go back and look at the video of Vesmanov, I'll put it in the links, where he explains that by 1983, the West was already demoralized. And demoralized means exactly, <laughs> literally what it says, their morals have been removed. And the idea was, to loosen the anchors to the family, the church, the community, so that all people could have to lean on was the state. And this has been incredibly successful. We have at least half the population in the West uh, in one form of socialism, some form of leftism they subscribe to. And when you bring truth and logic and reason to them, they will not answer you with logic and reason. This is partially indoctrination and this is partially because they have been schooled in the Alinsky method, which is where you do not argue an argument with facts, you argue using ridicule. So you bring out something factual to them and they will respond like a vampire responds to sunlight, holy water, a cross and garlic. They will recoil and they will go absolutely berserk and they will come after you en masse. So don't try to uh, use logic and reason with them. In fact, don't try to argue with them at all, because the chances are that, like me, you are not skilled and schooled in the art of cult extraction. I've had to learn this the hard way, and um, my advice to you is, yeah, you know, consider your your skill set and what you know about. And if you are not uh, somebody familiar with how to extract people from cults, stay away because 
as I say, inquisition. That is literally what they are. It is a church, it is a cult. Now let's talk about Karl Marx, this lovely little man. Okay, when he died in 1883, only about a dozen people attended his funeral. Yeah, I'm not surprised. He was such a thoroughly nasty, narcissistic, psychotic individual. Uh, extremely malicious and spiteful, and we're going to go into all of these uh, details. So here's a very, very profound point. Few thinkers whose ideas have been as influential on various aspects of modern world history. Indeed, as some have said, no other faith or belief system has had such a worldwide impact as Marxism since the birth of Christianity and the rise of Islam. Absolutely. As I said, this is a new religion. It is called statism. They worship the state. And yeah, they, led, they, they love a revolution. And Marx had this vision of a new society and a new man and a completely egalitarian society where there is no room, by the way, for people who are geniuses or thinkers or uh, the philosophers who do not subscribe exactly to this worldview. There's no room for them because when they say egalitarian, what they are talking about is the cult of mediocrity. And if Marx was anything, he was mediocre. I know he is touted as a genius of a man and a brilliant thinker. Well, I disagree strongly. He was very mediocre. He was a lazy man and a mediocre mind at best. However, he did have one genius, and that was he tapped into something in the zeitgeist that people warmed to immensely, a certain kind of person. And that thing is envy. And mediocre people are generally envious people. They cannot bear it that anyone is smarter or richer or more talented than they are. So this was an incredibly powerful um, uh, psychological state to tap into and it has worked wonderfully. I just want to go over some of Marx's history now. Yes, he, he was born in Trier, and very interesting thing about this Prussian town is that there is a high school called Trier in the United States, an enormous amount of extremely influential uh, politicians have come from that high school. This was recently brought to my attention. I'm not going to go into the details of it, it's safe to say that is a very interesting something on the side. Yeah. His parents were Jewish, he was Jewish, and indeed he did come from a long line of respected rabbis. And um, his father converted to Protestantism for career reasons. Now this is not abnormal. People seem to think it is only the Jews that do this. But in fact, there is another very good example, and that is when Islamic countries conquer um, a country which is not of their religion. They reduce the people who do not follow Islam in that country to dhimmi status, D-H-I-M-M-I, -M -M dhimmi status. That means they have less rights, they pay more taxes, and over time you think, oh well, this is just too much for me, I am going to convert because, you know, jobs, family, you've got to think about how you are going to get by in society. So this exceptionally lazy man, <laughs> uh, he caused trouble wherever he went. And um, yes, he, he had uh, uh, a, a mistress. He was actually a very abusive man to both his children and to his wife and to his friends. I just want to briefly find some interesting quotes over here. Okay, now people, th uh, this concerns me most terribly is that many people in Africa and other countries follow this man when he was an absolute 
racist who used racial slurs, yes, and insulting words to describe the mannerisms or appearance of his opponents in the socialist movement. Uh, and this went for everybody, including Jews. And I am not even going to read this. It appalls me. It offends me to my core. I am extremely, extremely offended by racism. Let's have a look at how some of his friends saw him. So this is Tekhov. He was from Prussia and I think from the military. And yes, he certainly knew Marx very well. He gave me the impression of both outstanding intellectual superiority and a most impressive personality. Now, the impression is what you need to focus on, the impression of outstanding intellectual superiority. Because this is a feature of both stupid people and psychopathic and sociopathic people. They are very sure of themselves. And this is how they turn into absolute con men and so on. This is how a Ted Bundy, the serial killer, managed to impress people and look like he was an intelligent, charming young man when in fact he was a most brutal serial killer. So the impression is not, uh, this is not any sign that he was in fact an outstanding intellectual uh, uh, superior. It was a sign that yeah, th that would be a hallmark of not so well in the head. And then he carries on. He says, I've only had as much heart as brain, as much love as hate. Yeah, if he only had that much. He was an extremely hateful man. And then look at this. I would have gone through the fire with him, despite the fact that he did not, that not only did he not hide his contempt for me, but as the end was, quite explicit about it. Despite all his assurances to the contrary, precisely because of them, I was left with the impression that personal domination is the end all of his every activity. And yes, you will see other people making similar points. Uh, this was an extremely domineering man. And it's very interesting. Oh, this is brilliant. He laughs at the fools who repeat after him his proletarian catechism as he laughs at other communists and also at the bourgeoisie. And by the way, he laughed at people who called themselves Marxists as well. So here's your hero laughing at you and mocking you. Um, a man full of hate, a man full of uh, bitterness and ugliness. Yeah, let us go on and have a look at more about him. Okay, uh, this Jenny von Westphalen, Johanna Bertha Juli Jenny von Westphalen, was Marx's wife. And uh, she was a theatre critic and political activist well, obviously only a social justice warrior could marry somebody like Marx. And they had seven children, only three made it into adulthood, which is not surprising considering how much filth and squalor they lived in. Uh, Yeni apparently was quite a party animal. And so she was relatively neglectful of her children and the house, as I say, was absolutely filthy. So neither she or Marx bothered to clean anything up uh, naturally. Now here's the interesting thing. Marx says very little about the aristocracy and the um, royalty and royalty. And of course, he was never going to marry a prole because Marx had aspirations to grandeur. He did not want to be down, he wanted to be up. So he marries uh, this woman who comes from the most incredible line of aristocracy, nobility, and even royalty from King, King James the First. Dukes, the most powerful family in Scotland. Oh, and this is lovely. Karl Marx would be arrested for trying to pawn some of Yeni's silverware bearing the ducal insignia. 
Yeah, that's the kind of man he was. So he marries this woman and she's obviously up in status and her family supports him because he doesn't actually work. And yeah, they're the poor children. Now, who isn't mentioned over here uh, is his illegitimate child because he had an affair with the maid. Yes, Marx, the bourgeois, <laughs> the absolute epitome of the bourgeoisie, son of lawyers and absolutely middle class, the man who married up, had a maid, a proletariat maid, and he had an affair with her. And let's have a look at this poor maid, Helene Demut. And I sincerely hope she was more attractive than this photo indicates. The poor woman had to uh, put up with his affections. I don't know that she was the most wonderful housekeeper given the descriptions of the squalor in his actual house. She had a child with Marx. Uh, they hid it from Yeni. Engels and his other friends helped to cover up the pregnancy. And this poor child was a little boy was born and then placed in the hands of a prole family because naturally the illegitimate child could not be seen in good society. And by the way, for all his rejection of uh, the mores of middle-class society, Marx was not going to be seen fathering an illegitimate child. So he was as middle-class as it came. And the son, as he grew up, he was allowed to visit his mother, but he had to come in through the back door of the house and only when Marx, his father, was not there. So I don't know how, uh, you know, this is just absolutely appalling. Now, here's another interesting thing is that not only Yeni helped him with his work, Engels did a great deal of Marx's work, and then finally, Helen, the pair worked in tandem after his death to organize and arrange for the publication of Marx's literary estate. And uh, discovering in the process, the manuscript it, from which Engels was able to uh, reconstruct the second volume of Das Kapital. Are you kidding me? So he didn't even write the second volume of Das Kapital. In fact, he wrote very little. So the maid was helping to organize his affairs. Let's remember that when you are worshiping Herr Marx, that his prole maid was uh, assisting in his uh, literary endeavors. And by the way, if you ever wanted to talk about putting the hands, the means of production rather into the hands of the proletariat, well, I can't imagine anything more apt than fathering a child. And this was the poor son, Frederick, Yes, he wasn't even allowed to have the name Marx. Absolutely appalling life. Now we're going to have a look at Friedrich Engels, who was Marx's dear friend and benefactor, because basically he um, supported Marx in every single way. Not only did he support him, but he wrote much of Marx's work. Many of the articles Marx allegedly wrote for uh, various uh, newspapers and magazines were actually in fact written by Engels. And um, yes, he co-authored and my guess is he wrote more of the communist manifestos than we would like to believe if we are a Marxist. If you have a look at this poor man, you can see he had a weak face. Like Tekhov, he was abused by Marx. He was incredibly devoted to him. And as I say, this is sort of almost like Scientology with L. Ron Hubbard, where people become devoted to their cult leader. You see it also with various cults. They become absolutely devoted and it's a form of Stockholm syndrome. And I suspect it's because he was so abusive but he obviously had the kind of personality that could lure people in, particularly weak people. 
And if you look at poor Engel's face, yeah, he looks like your average liberal today. Uh, he was certainly not his own master. So yes, he supported Marx and he wrote much of Marx's material. Extraordinary. We are going to continue. Why was Marx such a repulsive man? Well, part of the answer lies in a terrible disease he had. So let's address now, that. Part of the reason for Marx's disposition, his nasty and vindictive disposition, was a skin disease. And I am really concerned at how few people are aware of it, given that this disease has profound psychological effects. Not surprisingly. And I just want to say, uh, I do not want to sound as though I am uh, taking it lightly because this is a truly awful disease. I considered going in and showing uh, photographs of what it does to your system and your body. And I decided against it because they are that disturbing. So uh, my deepest sympathy to anybody who has it and for Marx as a human being, well, my sympathy. However, that is mitigated by the fact that so many have suffered so dreadfully as a result of his policies. So what was it? He had nonstop, endless boils. And uh, this is fairly widely now diagnosed, in fact, everywhere I've looked, as hydrodenitis suppurativa. Let me break that down for you. Hydra is water, that means sweating, skin. I don't know how many people are familiar with the word separating sores anymore. Uh, Suppurativa, that means that they are basically erupting and oozing. Um, now the disease affects the apocrine sweat glands found mainly in the armpits and groin. And it results in hideous boils and lumps and abscesses and they are continually leaking fluid uh, they are erupting and um yeah as i say it's a very very unfortunate disease uh, the apocrine sweat glands that they politely say in the armpits and groin of course it also happens in the arsh and marx most certainly had it in the arsh and I shudder to think of what kind of a, a disposition you could develop if you had to sit on that all day. As I say, you are welcome to go and have a look at photographs, uh, images and more details about this disease. It is horrendous. It is absolutely horrendous. In addition, I want you to remember that Marx was hygienically challenged. He did not like the slippery stuff known as soap and water. He avoided bathing wherever he could. So he was a stinky man covered in dreadful lesions. And yes, it is a, 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 a vicious, vicious disease. Marx often told friends about his health and described his skin lesions as curs and swine, understandably. Marx said he was aware that it affected his writing. He was writing his big works like Das Kapital, that's volume one, because if we'll remember Engels and the maid, Helen Dermot had to put together Das Kapital uh, two, at a time when the disease was particularly bad and it was pretty clear that he was not in the best moods when he was writing it. Now, if you're going to follow Marx and you are unaware that he suffered from this horrifying skin disease, which absolutely you do not have to be a psychologist or a psychiatrist or a rocket scientist to work out that it is going to enormously affect uh, your psychological situation. And yes, it explains his self-loathing and his feeling of alienation, which you see in his writing. And this is very interesting, Marx, told the philosopher Friedrich Engels, the bourgeoisie will remember my carbuncles until their dying day. Well, actually, no, they have largely managed to bury this information. And I have asked quite a few uh, self-styled Marxists, you know, what they have to say about it and what they think uh, the problem 
would be in, in the way he would see the world, they didn't know a thing about it. They actually, one accused me of lying. And um, when you pull up links showing that this is in fact the case, <laughs> they either attack you personally or they they block you they cannot bear this information they actually cannot stand it so i don't think most marxists are taking this into account in fact i would say about 90 percent of them have no idea that he had this issue whatsoever and we are now going to take a look at a very good example of how this affected him psychologically okay this is Ulanem, which is one of Marx's attempts at writing fiction. And it is quite positively the most abysmal piece of writing you could ever find. It's, it, it's sort of like a bad Mills and Boone written by somebody who has a thesaurus and a, a really uh, hateful disposition to boot. It is terrible. It is so bad that my eyes watered while reading it. I'm ashamed for him um, uh, that the Marxists uh, organization would actually even publish it. I would hide it. It is that bad. So let's have a look at a few of the words. Bound in eternal fear, splintered and void, bound to the very marble block of being, bound, bound forever and forever bound. The worlds, they see it and go rolling on and howl the burial song their own death and we we apes of a cold god still cherish with frenzied pain upon our loving breast the viper so voluptuously warm i will spare you any more but i think the apes of a cold god very much explains how he saw the world this sense of alienation or this sense of doom the sense of absolute misery uh, so yes bound to the marble a block of being um yeah so i don't this is not the, the work of an intelligent mind that's for sure you're welcome to read the entire thing i i i, I couldn't stop laughing because it's so melodramatic um be that as it may let us continue so yes that's that that's a glimpse into marx uh, the man and his passionate uh, feelings. You would think that Marx wrote Das Kapital and it was instantly a hit. In fact, it wasn't. It was resurrected with a whole lot of propaganda, thanks to the genius of people like Bernays, who certainly knew how to manipulate the stupid masses. Uh, at, when it was published, it, people thought it was rubbish. Not surprisingly, I actually have it. And well, okay. Okay, so it was finally published in 1867. It perplexed Marx's colleagues with its complex terminology and rambling. Yeah, you see that you throw in enough um, big words and, and, and you talk enough BS and people will actually <laughs> take it seriously especially if you if you have the confidence uh, uh, to to peddle this garbage to gullible people <laughs> oh let me yeah Pause. so it took a whole lot of propaganda and a whole lot of work to get a <laughs> dust capital any attention and you know the interesting thing is that there are brilliant marxists and I think they suffer from uh, an incredible case of Dunning-Kruger syndrome because they are brilliant people, but they're absolutely trapped in this uh, cult-like ideology. And remember, very intelligent people do fall into cults. It's not a, a, a mark of intelligence so much as um, something in the personality that is inclined to look for a leader, a savior, a messiah, um of the immediate kind and it won no attention among critics or readers <laughs> and marx would comment that sales would not even pay for the cigars he smoked while writing it 
Yeah, and let me tell you, Marx had very expensive taste. He loved smoked meats that were expensive. He loved expensive liqueurs, and he loved expensive cigars. Yenny, his wife, felt utterly defeated. Well, at least she had some sanity, unlike uh, the Marxists who then fell for this gibberish when it was repackaged and, 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 and sold to them as, as some work of genius. She had lived for the promise of capital, perhaps even believing that it would produce the desired effect, that it would change Germany, change the world, change their lives for the better. Well, if only Yeni had lived long enough. However, yes, it has changed the world into a very bloody and ugly one. Uh, the amount of people killed under Marxist, Leninist, communist regimes is extraordinary. Um, change lives for the better. It might have changed their lives for the better, because in the words of George Orwell in Animal Farm, all pigs are equal but some pigs are more equal than other pigs, and they would certainly have been among the pigs who were more equal. And now we go into some more that would explain how Marx got to his uh, bizarre philosophies. Okay, I want to look at some of Marx's quotes and some of his ideology, where you can disagree if you want to, but I see somebody with a god delusion, somebody with a serious god delusion and um, a lot of peculiar ideas about himself. Now, if you have ever wondered where globalism came from, well, here we go. The communist society will be classless and stateless. It is characterized by shared ownership of the means of production. Uh, now, I just want to give you an, an extraordinary insight. Are you telling me that if I invent some little bolt uh, that is an absolutely revolutionary bolt that changes the way cars are made forever, and I go and get a loan, and I um, start working in my little back room to make these, and then people want more, and I employ somebody, and eventually I have a big factory, that the workers are entitled to what I created, took loans for, spent long hours doing, this must now go to the workers, who many of them don't have the highest IQ because you want to go and have a look at the bell curve of IQs and not everybody is fit for leadership or to run um, accounting and so on which is why I can point to numerous instances in my own country of where handing over the means of production to the workers has been a catastrophic failure. And by the way, IQ is not the only thing because some people have high IQ, some people have a better ability to work with their hands. It's not the only thing, but the idea that anybody, a, a worker, just you know, somebody who actually puts, packs things in on a conveyor belt because that's all they can do. The idea that they can now run a country is, or a, a company is absolutely insane. That is just, it beggars belief that it's so stupid. So yes, uh, yes, the, the antithesis between mental and physical labor has vanished. Well, in Marx, it had vanished because he was not one for physical labor. In fact, he even declined a trip to go and see a horrendous factory. Engels invited him and uh, to go and have a look at the workers firsthand and received a really curt and nasty reply uh, to the effect of, I'm such an important person that I don't have time for this nonsense. So the idea that he cared about the workers is ridiculous. The idea that you can simply hand over uh, a factory to people who have no greater skills than packing goods is preposterous. It's absolutely insane. But yet, thanks to envy being such a, a huge, huge emotion to tap into, we are, we are getting there. And of course, uh, the entire world is failing and it will fail and people will starve. 
because that's what happens. That is what happens when you impose these uh, concepts on societies. Okay, private property will everywhere be replaced by social ownership. Again, I refer you to Animal Farm and George Orwell. And all pigs are equal, but some pigs are more equal than others. So if social ownership is a Chairman Mao having half the country killed in his cultural revolution, well, I don't know that that's social ownership. It seems to me that some pigs most definitely own more than others. And yes, the, the destruction of private property. You know when else they destroyed you? You didn't have any private property in the days where feudalism worked. Yeah, you didn't have any property during feudalism either. Uh, so this is really a will to serfdom, a will to mediocrity and a will to serfdom from the delusional people who follow this insane concept. You know, abolish all private property, uh, but I don't think, again, Chairman Mao or um, Lenin or anyone is going to be tossed out of the uh, presidential palace and so on. The, the, there's some property that belongs to everybody, but not all property does. Now we go to even more insane. The division of labor and specialization will disappear completely. What? The new liberated communist human being with its realized enormous potential will have need and ability to perform many kinds of work. I see. Okay, so does that mean that your diehard Marxist is going to uh, go to the gardener to have brain surgery? I really want to know. If there's no hierarchy and so because I can tell you now, I, I would choose the person who has um, the actual qualifications and there is no way in hell I would be putting my life in the hands of uh, a liberated communist human being with enormous potential. I don't care. You're not coming near me with scalpel. Okay, low there we go. Um, here we go again. This is delusional. While in a communist society where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, but each can become accomplished in any branch he wishes. Society regulates the general production and this makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another thing tomorrow. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming a hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. That's because he wasn't any of those things, and so he doesn't know that all of them require immense skill, hard work, and a certain talent. You know, not everybody is cut out for every job. For instance, rearing cattle, which is something I know something about. Uh, my grandfather, sought to breed cattle that were most fitting for a, a very uh, arid climate in Namibia. And I have the most hugest pile of correspondence between him and somebody he found who was also inter interested in the same thing. And the amount of work that they put into, you know, finding exactly the right way to rear them and so on, it's astonishing. So I, I have no idea who has got time to rear cattle with absolutely no knowledge. And yes, there we have Chinese workers and peasants are jubilant on their way to communist paradise. It, we, we, we won't talk about the great famine and the great leap backwards and the destruction of all their history. No, no, no. We are going to look at this. It gets even better. The exclusive concentration of artistic talent in some individuals and its suppression in the grand mass, which springs from this is a consequence of the division of labor. In a communist society, there are no painters, but men who among other things do painting. I don't know how many people are familiar with the Sistine Chapel, which was painted by one Michelangelo. 
you have any idea how much work that was? Do you have any idea uh, how long he was apprenticed for? Do you have any idea the physical toll it took on him to paint? The hours and hours, he, he actually developed ailments and illnesses and chronic pain from doing that work. The idea that, you know, you can just flit from rearing cattle and being a fisherman to painting the Sistine Chapel and just be good at everything. This is delusional. This is Marx and this is absolutely delusional. And of course, Hegel was pretty delusional as well, which and Marx obviously siphoned a lot of Hegel's work. By well-educated men, we understand in the first instance those who can do everything others can do. Well, let me tell you something. I am the first person to say I can't sew. So if somebody needs um, clothing, I can't do it. I am literally incapable. I failed sewing. I tried my best. I am not good with certain things. I can do some things very well and I, and I can't do other things at all. And I would not dream of having the audacity to assume I could do everything. I can't be a surgeon. Uh, I can't be an engineer. Good grief. I can't even build a Lego bridge. So it's preposterous, the idea that, and yeah, I'm pretty well educated, but uh, I, I'm not a Marxist. So I suppose that's why I have these failings. Okay. Activities in common will be preferred. Yes, because that means mediocrity is preferred. Or when you uh, go to the level of the common man, uh, go, go, go and take an IQ, go and take any any set of marks or something, uh, marks as in class marks, and you put them all together and you divide them up among the people uh, and how many people were responsible for them, you get the median, the mediocre, the mid-range. And that means there's no Michelangelo, there, there are no geniuses, there are, there are no uh, people with any sort of uh, extraordinary ability. And what they actually do is they root them out. If you look at what Marx did, he got rid of absolutely anybody who could think or, or was capable or did anything. He basically left all the mediocrities, uh, the snitchy mediocrities too in place. Hang on, I have, I am looking after two more dogs that somebody has done, so let me just leave this for a moment. There is no bottom to the crazy that was Karl Marx, so hold on to your hats because there is more. Um, another important characteristic of communist society is the high degree of cooperation and mutual commitment. Well, if you've ever seen a, a Marxist revolution, yes, they, they are extraordinarily cooperative and they have extraordinary mutual commitment. It's like a pack of rabid hyenas filled with bloodlust who just go and kill and murder and loot and destroy. What happens after that killing and looting and, and destruction? Of course, now we're in dodgy ground because they only actually cooperate to break things. When it comes to making things, mm, doesn't work so well. The things that people do together, good Lord, can you imagine? Establishment of industrial armies, yes, industrial armies, you absolute lunatic. Who's gonna head them? Okay, so yes, he thinks that uh, uh, these were all very friendly. You can see them smoking and drinking and eating together. Mm, yeah, not, not actually working in the field, not laboring and toiling. It's pretty easy to be sociable when you are sitting in a cafe, smoking, drinking and eating. People without these, uh, uh, you know, luxuries, not so fun. Uh, this is another sign of the God complex, and this is actually demonic. Um, it talks about man being a, oh, let me just go back to this, a social animal such as apes. Remember that absolutely atrocious piece of hysterical and melodramatic writing where he describes 
As apes chained to a marble block, apes of a cold god. Yeah, I we are some of us are trying to transcend our genes and um your descent to the bottom is not for everyone. That granted a lot of people go for it. Now, anybody who claims that uh, they wish to, this is a unique feature of the communist society, the mastery of control that humans will exert over all forces and objects of nature. This is revolting. This actually is nauseating to me. It is so disgusting. For the first time, consciously, the new man uh, basically treats all natural premises as the creatures of men, strips them of their natural character and subjugates them to the power of individuals united. Well, subjugation is very big in communist ideology. The idea that you would have the temerity to speak about nature like this. We live on this planet at the grace and by the grace of nature. You think you have it all under control? Well, you are just one super volcano, one asteroid, one massive earthquake away from being wiped out. We, we live, uh, we have no idea how close to the brink we live. And these are the only real solutions to the conflict between man and nature. There is no conflict between man and nature. Nature rules and we do the best we can within that structure. We are nature, we are not above nature. Go and look, we've got the same genes as a bloody fruit fly to a large extent. I think like half our genes are the same as a fruit fly. And you want to talk about being you know, better than nature. This is, and by the way, Marxism is supposed to be terribly scientific. Yeah. Uh, yes, they are manipulating. Like, yeah, these people actually really were and are uh, influenced by him. They follow him to the letter that we have climate change uh, because apparently nobody's ever heard of solar flares. <laughs> and the fact that, yes, indeed, climate does change because if you go back in history, at one point, the Sahara Desert was a tropical paradise. Anyway, we're going to we're going to do better than that. There will be no enforced rules and coercion, really. So all these people, all these people who um, uh, you know are, are completely mercenary, uh, these groups of revolutionaries are going to suddenly turn into meek and mild people who just follow follow what everybody has to do to behave. Um, oh, lovely. Uh, the organization in agriculture will lead the work in the same way as a conductor leads a willing orchestra. Yeah, this is because Marx has never done work in the fields, so he doesn't realize that it's just not that, that simple. And even better, soldiers, police officers, executioners, legislators, and judges will be unnecessary under appropriate conditions in society. Well, this is the Marxist insane vision, and they really believe in this. Go and argue with them. Trust me, they believe that Marx has the answer to all problems, and this world under Marxism, leftism is going to be magnificent. It's going to be transformed, yes, to a bunch of Stepford wives with um, the IQ of dunces uh, who, you know, can only do robots. I mean, why don't you just go and get yourself a whole bunch of robots? Because uh, this is no longer human beings with all their quirks and their interesting things and discoveries. This is now robots. Punishment will really be nothing but the sentence passed by the culprit on himself. I see. So somebody who is a serial killer and who actually has a defect in the brain, which is um, to say his neocortex is not wired up. It is the, the hard wiring is off. So it's not wired up to his uh, limbic brain and the primitive brain. 
he is going to um, pass a sentence on himself, the person who enjoys killing people. Good grief. This is, you cannot, this is madder than a box of frogs. There is absolutely no understanding of human psychology, interestingly enough. Yeah, violence from without is violence on himself. And he will see in other men his natural saviors. <laughs> from the sentence on which he has pronounced on himself. Mm. In other words, the relationship will be reversed. Criminals will have to judge and punish themselves. Well, again, you know, if you're completely delusional, you've had a break, psychotic break with reality, perhaps. And this is an excellent point uh, that uh, this website makes Dunderbus from Denmark. Modern prisons <laughs> are very close to the communist ideal. And this is certainly true in Scandinavian countries. I mean, they live more luxuriously than I do. <laughs> Prisoners have access to a fitness center, weekend breaks, family visits. Uh, the cells are with private bars, refrigerators, and TV. <laughs> Every day, delicious food is served. <laughs> in the new prison in Greenland, the inmates also have a beautiful sea view and the opportunity to take care of their work in a nearby city. Yeah, remember that guy who, who killed all the people, I think it was in Norway, his blonde psychopath, his name eludes me for the moment. He could actually launch a complaint by his attorneys that he didn't like his bread or, or, or the butter wasn't good enough. Hmm, so <laughs> this is what Marxism is. And you, you know, if, uh, if you think about people who live on the streets in terrible circumstances and the elderly who are dumped by their families, perhaps this uh, this is a step up. I, I certainly know that in Cape Town, people who live on the streets will commit crimes in order to get into jail because winter is so terrifying, winter on the streets. So yeah, they, I, I can see this, uh, this and as I say, the, luxury hotel yep it's certainly greenland and all of these places you know you would wish for a, a life of such comfort it's like living in a hotel uh, with every, everything included and you don't have to pay for it and and you are rewarded for your evil by basically yeah eu leaders are working extraordinarily hard to realize Marx's insane visions and making Europe uh, nations extremely globalism, stateless, nationless. Yeah, you you import lots of people. And by the way, you are ruining uh, the countries from which you are importing these people. This is a brain drain. You are taking mostly men. You are leaving women and children to fend for themselves. It is appalling. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Yes, so it appeals to the individual's dreams of a perfect society because this man who was such a disaster in every way in his own life can create a perfect society. I have a bridge to sell you in the desert because if you believe that, you believe anything. Yeah, so it, this is the idea that you're going to have a perfect society which is going to be ethically superior. <laughs> Oh, yes. Meta history is just going, well, he's talking about social settings like apes and baboons. And as I say, Herr Marx obviously has never seen a trope of baboons. So if he had, uh, well, his delusions might be somewhat shattered. Um, yeah, well, the, 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 Cultural revolution was one of the most horrifying things. Okay, let me move on. Now, the interesting thing about Marx's uh, life in Britain, in the United Kingdom, living in London, is that this gentleman, this is the height of colonialism. I mean, 18, 18, what was it? Mid 1800s to 1900. Um, it, it ring any bells, any red flags going off. This is the height of colonialism. This is the reign of Queen Victoria who became Empress of India. 
and Mr. Marx is sitting in London and he is stumm. He doesn't have a word to say about it. Fascinating. Not so surprising when you remember that his wife has aristocratic and noble uh, family and uh, that he really hates the middle classes because he sort of wants the world to return to serfs and kings, and he aspires to be among the kings. So he didn't have a word to say about Queen Victoria. He didn't have a word to say about the invasion of India, um, the horrific uh, situation in South Africa, where they put the Boers in concentration camps and genocided half the population, a quarter actually 25%. Not a word to say about any of it. He's living right in London, not a protest, not a sniff. And note how many Marxists are anti-imperialist. Oh, it's okay. Where, what have they got to say about Queen Victoria? He is a living under the reign of Queen Victoria. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Princess Victoria, who was her daughter, expressed something of an interest in this bizarre little man. And... Um, uh, uh, an intermediary, Duff, uh, sent her back a letter uh, who, you know, of his meeting and described him in extraordinarily, uh, what is the word, uh, kind terms. Kind terms. Yeah, so, you know, obviously there's, there's nothing really to see there. Let us continue. Now here's something that has always astonished me. There can be nothing more communist than central banking. And Bakunin, is it Bakunin or Bakunin? Okay, he is uh, he socialist and anti-Semitic, to be clear. And he points out that the world was solidly sitting between Marx on the one side and Rothschild on the other side. Interesting factoid, Marx, uh, his original family name was Mordechai. Marx is related, was related to the Rothschilds. Lionel de Rothschild was his, I think, third cousin. Mm. <laughs> they related. Uh, and that's probably why you never hear Marx is talking about the banks. They'll go and break down, you know, little coffee shops in the, in, in the center of town and um, destroy and disrupt sort of ordinary everyday things, but you never see them anywhere near the banks. And I have actually asked somebody who claimed to be Antifa, why don't you go to the banks? I mean, you know, this, is, this is where all the money is really going. Why doesn't Marx talk about the banks more? And it was just an absolute bank stare. All they could, re they respond with uh, the means of production doo -doo -doo -doo, and taken into the hands of the workers, extraordinarily brainwashed. They cannot actually think for themselves. So yes, hands up who doesn't think central banking is communism. Actually, the world is living in a communist state. And if you think you're living in a democracy, well, you're living in a communist state, you just haven't found out yet. Yeah, so that's the banks. Let's have a look at another strange thing. Marx hated the Jews, the Slavs and the Russians. What does he have in common with another person? Okay, because you hear all these leftists screaming, fascist, you are literally Hitler. And they are so much superior. Well, here's the thing. Marx hated Russians. Marx hated Slavs. He believed they were genetically inferior. And Marx hated Jews. And what does that have in common? Well, if you go and look at uh, Hitler, if you've actually done any history, you'll find that he targeted the Slavs. They were also killed in concentration camps. He obviously despised Russians. And naturally, he hated Jews. So actually, if fascism and uh, Marxism are one and the same thing, these are cut from the same cloth. I don't know how with a straight face you can actually say, uh, other people are Hitler and accuse them of being racist and so on, given the horrifically, horrifically um, racist comments Marx had to make. Go and look them up. There are many more. 
um, his blatant racism towards uh, um, Slavs and Russians and the insane insane parts of his ideology. I don't know. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe it? Okay, I'm going to leave it here for now. I was going to go over more about his uh, philosophy. I hesitate to call it that. His insane um, ideology is more like it. But there just isn't time. So I thought, let me rather do that in a separate, in a separate video. So yeah, let me know. Did you know all of this about Marx? What do you think? Would you still follow him after finding out all of this? I'd love to know. Thank you, Chesra, signing out.